Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Street Church. If you're watching online, please let us know that you're here with us today and that uh, um, we really, truly appreciate you being here. For those who are traveling and, and unable to be here today or have sickness, uh, we ask a special blessing on you again this morning. And uh, we're just glad you're here. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we got lots of stuff for announcements today, so I'm gonna get through these as quickly as I can. Uh, this Wednesday, we are continuing on with our series on The Chosen, 7 o'clock p.m., and we are all the way up to episode six out of eight. So it's hard to believe that we're getting this close already to ending season three. And this one is entitled uh, Intensity in Tent City. So uh, it's really a play on words. But uh, as we saw in the last few episodes, they had all these people who had heard the Sermon on the Mount or heard about the Sermon on the Mount had come to town and set up a tent city out there and causing the Romans a little bit of displeasure in, in what's going on. And then we see, you know, Jesus is getting himself prepared for what he knows is coming, but the others don't. And so that's causing some confusion amongst the uh, uh, apostles now that they're no longer disciples because he has already sent them out once. Um, and so we see a lot of the different back plays and backstories coming into being in here and uh, this will be the longest episode uh, that they have in the series so this one's 72 minutes long Wednesday night so be prepared bring popcorn or whatever you'd like uh, it's a good time and we'll have some really nice discussions like we did last week I'm sure coming up this next Saturday is the conclusion of season 18 for orange track racing that means it's the finals and so they have all the double eliminations and all the rest of things going on, the car of the year, everything that's going to be happening on Saturday. So it runs a little bit longer, but uh, registration at 9.30 and racing starts at 10. So should be a really good time. Then we're going to start a new Christmas tradition. And beginning, uh, beginning December 1st, we want you to read one chapter in the book of Luke each evening. There's 24 chapters in Luke, so then on Christmas Eve you'll read the entire account of Jesus' life and you'll wake up on Christmas morning knowing who and why we celebrate Christmas. Then, coming up right after that, our next men's breakfast is December 2nd, 9 o'clock a.m. We had some nice discussions going on yesterday. It's kind of fun because we got some car guys coming in here, so we're talking about cars for quite a bit of the time. Uh, but uh, some, some good discussion going on there. But it's a good time to fellowship together and just get together, and then we have a nice devotion each and every time. Then, starting on December 3rd, as I say, we got a lot of fun stuff going on. We began our four-week Advent series, Why the Nativity, by Dr. Uh, David Jeremiah, and uh, that's going to start on December 3rd. And through the series, we're going to answer the questions on why, um, why did Jesus become a man? Why Joseph? Why Mary? And why call him Savior? So there's going to be more information on this. That's going to be found on our webpage at Grace Street Church and Why the Nativity. Then, we're not done yet, so Christmas caroling. So we're going to uh, get with a few of the uh, care centers again, and we're going to go out on December 9th and do some Christmas caroling. We're gonna have some chili and cornbread and hot chocolate and all kinds of fun stuff to have in conjunction with that. So we hope that uh, you'll all be able to meet that. Then, <laughs> our next movie is gonna be January 6th and we're showing A Bridge to Terabithia. And that Bridge to Terabithia is uh, about a couple of preteens that get bullied in school and go through some changes. A new girl comes to school and and uh, they kind of uh, don't hit it off too well when they first meet each other and they first go together in there. And she kind of challenges him to one of the things that he thought he was the best at. And uh, they befriend each other uh, and then imagine this fantasy world where they escape all of the 
verbal abuse and the bullying and all the rest of these things and come through. And it's really a, a heartwarming story. And yes, we will have to break out the tissues for that movie. So, uh, but it's a really great movie. We've, we've shown it before um, in another setting in another church that we were at. And uh, we will have some things in the sermon series about that as well. Um, but it, it shows a healing process in there. And it's a great example of how things aren't quite what they seem from first glance. And I think it's a, a really good prove out on that story. So uh, really great movie. Look forward to that again, January 6th. Doors open at 5.30. Of course, we got all the fun accoutrements to go with it. Hot dogs and snacks, brownie bites, popcorn, pop, water, all the fun stuff. So be there or be square. That's the way it used to be. You remember that one, right? Okay, so let's go into a time of worship, shall we? Enter into a time of worship with prayer. Gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you for this day, this opportunity to gather here together freely and openly in your name. Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings you give us each and every day. And Lord, we thank you that you have a message that you're going to put on our hearts today to help us move through our lives and and to work through this world that we live in especially today we're going to talk about faith and we just ask a special blessing on pastor terry that uh when he gives his message that he gave him to uh share with us today and we we want to talk about our faith and, and what it means to actually follow you and so we we ask that you would open our ears to hear and our eyes to see the wonders of your world that you've created. We ask that you would open our heart to receive this message so that we can live it out each and every day of our lives. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So our call to worship that Pastor Cherry chose this morning comes from Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, and this is from the message translation. The fundamental fact of his existence that it's a trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd, meaning the unbelievers of the day. So that act of faith is what we show to God as our gift to him for the gifts that he gives us. And this verse talks about history, biblical history. And it's the story then of God's saving presence, leading the people to faith and providing testimony, which is encouraging to us and to persevere in our own faith journeys. And in the history of faith, then, faith involves the absolute confidence in God's historical saving acts. That means that for all the things that God has done in the past, we understand that those are true and actual and that builds, then, the foundation of our faith. If we look all the way back, God had led his people with acts of saving grace when they needed it the most. Not because they actually deserved his grace, but it was given, actually, in spite of their actions. So if we look back into the Bible, we notice that, you know, throughout the whole history of the Bible going through there, people kept turning away from God and turning away from what he was doing. And yet he still responded out of love and out of grace, and he brought the people through it. The nature of true faith leads us into that deep involvement then, into that biblical historical world that God had created for his chosen people. This by its very nature then creates that foundation of our belief system. And, you know, a couple years ago, we talked about belief system and what that foundationally means for us. Our faith and our faithfulness are the basis for our belief system. And that belief system is the call to faith that illustrates that nature of that belief in God. Faith is action based on certainty without the physical evidence. So I went back to my sermon from way back then, and I pulled out a couple of things in here. So, some of the things that I had compiled uh, were some points on faith that emphasize that impact of faith. Faith pleases God. Knowledge of God comes only through faith since God is invisible. We cannot actually see God 
we can see the actions of God in our world. Faith is the human action which God counts as righteousness to wipe out all sin charged against us. And faith trusts God promises even when they appear impossible. That one I think is really, really key. Faith reaches out to the eternal reward that God has promised to us. So as we talk about salvation, as we're living our life out for God and to follow the example of Jesus, then that faith is obeying God even when the divine demand appears unreasonable. Like, we can't do it. I'm sorry, God, you, you put too much on me. I can't do it. But if we have our faith, our faith will bring us through. Faith fears no human, only God. And faith identifies with God's people no matter how disadvantaged they are. Faith perseveres even when no reward is in sight. That's a key. And the faith of all Israel's heroes are found in the golden reward in Christ and in his atoning work for all of the bad that the people had done up to that point and all of the bad that people will do from that point forward. That's called salvation. If we have our faith in our salvation, then we know that we have a greater reward coming to us in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we come into this time of worship, we ask that you would bless Pastor Terry right now as he brings us his message. And we thank you and praise you for this faith that you have given us. Faith that we can understand you. Faith that we can see you even though you are unseen. Through all of the mighty acts, through all of the mighty deeds, and through all the blessings that you give us each and every day. We praise you and thank you in all these things. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Well, this is our part two of episodes five and six of Clean. And it's Last week, Mark started us off with uh, commissioned, what it looked like to be commissioned, sent out. And he talked about how they were sent out with just their clothes on their backs. No money, nothing. They had to fully rely on God. They had to rely on that faith. Now, as in this first part, or this first part of this two-episode uh, arc, that we see several conflicts arise around the people and things that were unclean. Capernaum's water supply was contaminated by sewage. Jairus' daughter became deathly ill as a result. Eden meets Veronica, who has suffered for 12 years from bleeding. In part two, Jesus and the disciples set to fixing things. Fixing the things that were causing the people of Capernaum to be unclean. Now, one of the things that we saw in here was Gaius and Peter coming together. A Roman and a disciple are now an apostle coming together to fix the sister. Not something we, any of us, maybe they have, would have expected to have seen. And on top of that, it was Rabbi Yusuf and his family who provided the supplies. If nothing else, in this moment, they show how people can come together despite their differences and work for the good of others. Then we see as Jairus is frantically looking through all the papers in his office. And Yusuf comes in and sees him in this panic and he is beside himself. His daughter is ill and could die at any moment. And in this same episode, Veronica believes with every fiber of her being that if she can just touch the fringe of Jesus' garment, that she would be healed. 
what's not able to be fixed. And that shows us that not everything gets fixed immediately. And I didn't catch this until the second time watching this, this episode. In the opening scene, we see a mother raising her daughter to the doctor. She's placed on the table of the doctors. She's been bleeding. We find out that she loses her baby. Now we're not sure if it was a miscarriage or a stillbirth, but she loses her child. The baby didn't make it. And now we get to understand some of the tension that we were introduced to in the previous episode between Simon Peter and Eden. Because the woman on that table was Eden. I can't imagine the loss of a child. I don't want to imagine the loss of a child, as you all know. Um, my daughter Amanda has stage five kidney disease. She is on dialysis now. And you can imagine the thoughts that want to race through one's head about your child. But we need to have faith. So let's fast forward now a couple of weeks and we're back to that, that tension between Simon and Eden. And we come to a, the scene where Jesus is eating breakfast with the disciples when one of them asks why they don't fast the way that John's disciples do. And that takes us to Matthew chapter 9, 15 and 17, where Jesus replies, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and then, then they will fast. See, John's disciples were fasting as a sign of mourning for the sin of all the people and in preparation for the Messiah's coming. And Jesus' arrival was like a wedding feast, and he was the groom. Now, if y'all have been to a wedding feast, there's no fasting. There's lots of food. Oftentimes a big cake, and in today's Sometimes that cake is now a, just a stack of cupcakes. Makes it much easier for everybody to do that. And then, of course, you've got the bride and the groom that want to, depending on how ornery they are, they want to shove the cake into each other's mouth or face, as the case may be. But there's no need to fast with Jesus being amongst them. Verse 16 says, Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth for the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth leaving an even bigger tear than before now i'm a child of the 70s and i remember mom patching my the holes in my jeans you'd have those kind of worn out jeans and you'd have the bright blue patch on them and if yours were like mine they didn't stay ironed up <laughs> it was always the iron on ones they were the easiest they never stayed on very well. They always started to peel off. And verse 17 takes us a little bit further to help us understand better. It says, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins for the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wine skins so that both are preserved. And then, uh, for those of you here and those of you watching online in the small print there, it says this story is also, or this is also spoken about in Mark chapter 2, uh, 18 and 22, as well as Luke 5, 34 and 39. But what happens? New wine expands as it ages. An old wine skin, if you've got leather gloves and they've gotten wet, they get a little bit hard and crunchy and they aren't very pliable. Well, that's the same thing with the old wine skin. So if you put old, new wine into that old wine skin, it's going to expand, but that old wine skin will not expand with it and it will ultimately burst. <coughs> so it needs to be like a new wine skin, it needs to be pliable so that it can expand with that new wine. And 
Jesus's teachings then, what we can take from this is that his teachings do not fit into the old framework. They don't fit into the old wineskins. So if you think about the teachings of the religious leaders of the time, it doesn't fit in there. As they're finishing this discussion, it is then that Rabbi Yusuf and Jairus come in and Jairus falls at Jesus' feet asking him to heal his dying daughter. And in this episode, he says, I know you. I know you. Think about that as you hear this from Mark 5, 22 and 43. And we're going to kind of break this up this morning. So it says, Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hand on her. Heal her so she can live. Now, interesting, you know, we talked about synagogue leaders previously, but what we did talk about is the fact that they have very close ties with the Pharisees. And because of this, they oftentimes would be pressured to stay away from Jesus. Do not associate with Jesus. So bowing before Jesus would have not only been significant, but also a daring act on his part, an act of respect and worship for God, for Jesus. But waving it in the face of the religious leaders. And then as the people made their way to Jairus' home, they were surrounded by people. As it will come up in, next in verse 24. Yet a young woman would fight her way through the crowd. Let's pick it up at verse 24 where it says, Jesus went with him and all the people followed crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten I'm going to stop there for just a moment. When it says she spent everything, that's not just the money that she had. It was her relationships with others. It was her relationship with her family. Because in an instance like this, a father would have disowned the child for the malady that they had, leaving her all alone. Mark continues on and says, in fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? The disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing against you. How can you ask who touched me? Now, for those of you that have been watching this uh, series with us, when you hear who touched my robe, can you all hear Peter from The Chosen saying that in your minds? He's got a very distinct voice and I can just hear him saying this to him. Then his disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. And then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. I think after 12 years, we can have a consensus that her condition was deemed incurable, especially for that time. Medicine was not what it is today. She was desperate for Jesus to heal her. She knew the religious law. She knew that if Jesus touched her, he would be unclean. And we can drop back to Leviticus uh, 11 and 5 or uh, 11 through 15 for this you've got six chapters of everything that causes things to be unclean from infectious diseases to childbirth to 
uh, discharges to touching a corpse and many others. She felt that her condition was keeping her from God. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you're in something and it's keeping you from God? Fact of the matter is, he's always there to help. Now our problems that seem impossible to us, if we think they're impossible for him, we have just put him into a little box. Never let that kind of fear keep you from bringing them to God. Bring those fears and problems to God. Pick it up at verse 35 where it says, While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, Your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? This child isn't dead. She's only asleep. Now, understand, these people are not family. They were Paid mourners. Could you imagine having that job? You get paid to go in and uh, one of them was playing a flute and the others were just wailing and crying and they had no connection to the family at all. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha Kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. Did y'all catch that? She was 12. The woman who was, had the bleeding, who we would call Veronica in the, the series, had been bleeding for 12 years. No coincidences in the Bible. But can you imagine the emotions that were going through Jairus' mind as they showed up and said, your daughter is dead, don't bother him anymore. He had gone to get Jesus to heal his daughter and now she is dead. what may have been going through his mind if all these people had not been surrounding us trying to get to Jesus for their own stuff would we have made it back in time but now she is dead very recently both Pastor Mark and I have lost our fathers Go from going at 100 miles an hour taking care of someone to it just stopping. The one thing that Mark and I both have is faith. And that faith gives us hope. And we both know this is knowledge because knowledge brings confidence and we are both confident that our fathers, as well as our mothers, are at home with Jesus, and we will be with them again one day. Now, switch gears and the thought, as I mentioned earlier in the sermon, about losing a child. I don't know if any of you have ever lost a child. I have not. But the emotions that it invokes in me, just that the thought of that are hard to deal with. Having this passage in the scriptures helps give me hope. I've watched Amanda. 
she was she has been growing in her faith for a long time now but it has gotten even closer her faith in God has gotten stronger through this strife she's gone through and so now I can have a confident hope and have faith in knowing that she regardless of what that ever happens that we too will one day be together again. I know how loudly I cried out when we finally found out that my dad had passed. And I can attest to the fact that I was screaming no over and over and over. I imagine I would be next to a consolable if one of our children or grandchildren were to die. So I can almost feel the heartbreak that Jairus must have had. I can imagine that fear was starting to slip in. That fear can bring confusion, it can bring uh, the diminishment of hope and becoming afraid. But then Jesus said to him, don't be afraid, just have faith. And from everything that Jairus had learned about Jesus, with everything that he learned and, and took him to believe that Jesus could heal his daughter when she was still alive, this would have brought the hope back into him. We need to remember when we are afraid and things look hopeless to look at the situation through God's eyes. Jesus' point of view, if you will. Because he said, don't be afraid, just have faith. When we fall back to our call to worship this morning from Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, where it said the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, set them above the crowd. It's the beginning point of our faith, and that's believing in God's character. He is who he says he is. When he says, I am, he's telling us. And the end point of this is believing in God's promises. Jesus said, don't be afraid, just have faith. He was going to fulfill what he had told Jairus he would do, and that was to heal his daughter. Jairus had done his research. He had based his going to Jesus on what he had read, what he had seen, what he had heard. And he believed in Jesus' character. And this is how he was able to believe Jesus' promise that his daughter would be okay. Now, if we fast forward to later on after Jesus' resurrection, and he goes and he stands amongst his disciples, Thomas says, he wasn't there. So he didn't, he was a little skeptical. You know, we got doubting Thomas. Well, in John 20, 25, it says, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Now, Jesus wasn't hard on Thomas, nor do I believe he was hard on Jairus at the news of his daughter's death. Jesus simply tells Thomas to touch his wounds. It is in seeing that Thomas believes. Then Jesus tells us what true faith is. This is John 20, 29, and he says, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Jairus saw Jesus, but he believed in him before he had even met him. In fact, remember he goes up in this episode and says, I know you. Hebrews 11.1 1 in the New Century Version says it this way, Faith means being sure of the things we hope for and knowing that something is real even if we do not see it. Now, after bringing Jairus' daughter back to life, Jesus tells them not to tell anyone. This goes for the daughter, his wife, himself, as well as Peter, James, and John, who couldn't even tell the other apostles. Why? There's no need. 
Everyone that had been there knew that this little girl would have died. So the facts would just simply speak for themselves. That, and it wasn't time in Jesus' ministry for that kind of, of, of people seeing all of that. It wasn't ready for that. But we have in this two very different life stories. Yesterday at our men's breakfast, we were talking about the, how Mark and I's life stories are very parallel and how they intersect. But other people in our lives are very different. And the things that we go through, and we've talked about this many times before. In fact, Mark recently, his last couple of sermons, had talked about how our experiences allow us to minister to others. Our unique experiences, our tests become our testimonies, and they allow us to minister to others. But even though there's different life stories, they have the same outcome through faith. When we experience loss, now it could be death, it could be a breakup, a job, finances, some kind of rejection. Do not give up on hope. Neither Veronica nor Jairus gave up hope. As Veronica is contemplating how she's going to get to Jesus, the man who had seen her before called her out as being unclean and he hollered for Rabbi Yusuf. And I was taken by how Rabbi Yusuf in this episode approached that. Not now, we will get to you later. Not chastising her for what she was wanting to do, but that they would take care of her later. Rabbi Yusuf was coming around. He was starting to get it. But what happens? She takes her shot. She sees an opening. She takes that shot. It's like watching the Vikings catch a football and running through the defense and getting that touchdown. I knew Mark would enjoy that one. <laughs> if only. <laughs> well, we can only hope. But she takes her shot, she sees it, and she just barely makes it, and she reaches out. And in this episode, we see her touch those tassels that are on her throat. And it's in that instant that she gets when we think back to Jairus' daughter, when he gets down by her ear and he says, tell me to go, little girl, get up. You can see the color come back into her face. She takes that breath. At the end of the movie that we saw last night in uh, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, The Last of the Chronicles of Narnia, as soon as the seventh sword is laid on Aslan's table, by all of, by who, none other than Eustace, who we never thought would do anything like that throughout the movie, we see life come back into the three lords that were sitting there. When we rely on God, when we put our hope and our faith in him and in Jesus, our Lord and Savior, life gets breathed back into us. We can't give up that hope. We have to have that confident hope. We have to think like Veronica does, if I can only touch the fringe. Jesus, in these two stories, demonstrates an incredible power and an incredible passion and he has that same power, that same love, that same passion for each and every one of us. Don't turn away from the one who can help. Do what Jairus and Veronica did. Put fear out of your mind. You know, that's what Eustace did last night. Even though he had that seventh sword stuck in his dragon body as he hits the, the beach, and he starts trying to tear off this outer covering. He doesn't want it anymore. And then Aslan shows up. And he removes that. And then Eustace fights his way to the table and puts
puts the sword there. He put fear out of his mind for the first time in probably his entire young life. He reached out to God in faith. Are you reaching out to God in faith? We all need to reach out to God in faith. God's grace, his mercy, his love and forgiveness will bring healing to our bodies, our souls, and our spirits. We just need to have faith. Heavenly Father, help us to please you through our faith. Place the desire in our hearts to want to learn more about you and grow closer to you each and every single day. Give us the courage to be bold and to seek you in a world that turns away from you. Help us to become more like Jesus and to honor you with every decision we make. In Jesus' name. into this time of communion today I ask you to think about your faith and what you put your faith in is it an inter internal faith or do you show your faith to the world now, a lot of people do that with uh, they wear a cross and for me the cross is an outward symbol of my inward commitment to God that faith that foundation of my beliefs and for many, it's just a fashion statement. And they just wear a cross because it looks cool. But the cross means so much more than that. That cross is a symbol of hope. It's a symbol of our faith. It's a symbol that God has put in place for those who have faith, for those who believe in him, who believe in Christ and in his sacrifice for us. That gives us that hope that there's more to life than when we die, we die. And it's all over. But instead, with faith, we have hope that we have eternal life in Christ. And we will see those who have gone before us again. So we have hope that springs eternal through eternal. As we come into this time, we're, we're called to remember then that act of faith, that act of salvation, that act of love, that act of grace on the cross. And on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Participate in that salvation. Likewise, he took the cup and after he blessed the cup, he said, this cup is the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. And so as we come into our time of communion here today, I ask you to do the same thing. As we, as we think about this, let's think about our faith. Let's think about the hope that we have in Christ, that we have salvation, that we have the opportunity for eternal life, through his grace, through his love, not from something we've done or that we deserve, but because we have faith in Christ. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be. As we come into our time for prayers to the people, do, do anyone have anything that uh, we need to call out? We've got a huge list over there that we go through on Wednesday nights. Uh, we post it online as well as send it out in the emails. Um, does anybody here have anything else they would like to share? Anyone they would like to put on the list? Okay. Well, we do want uh, prayers for travel for Steve and Denise as they went over to help winterize his uh, mother's place over in Illinois, so we want to make sure they get back home safely. Uh, I'll be leaving tomorrow morning to go down to St. Louis, 
And so I'll be in St. Louis the next few days and then coming back. So uh, praying for safe travel there again as well. Um, we have Jackie and her kids who joined us here last night for the movie. Uh, it was awesome. I loved it. They brought in this whole plethora of snacks that they had up there, pillows, blankets. It was cool. It really was. But uh, the young son, Gabriel, he felt sick overnight, so we want to pray that uh, he comes through that uh, and, and is all right. We want uh, prayers for continued healing for those who have gone through procedures um, and those who are about to have procedures as well. So we asked uh, and lift them up as well. Prayers for the homeless and the lost that are out there that we want to make sure that we um, stay in touch with that and, and make sure we do what we can for them as well and lift them up, especially coming into this cold weather. We had a little bit of a reprieve here for the last couple of days, but you know that's not gonna last. This is Iowa weather, give it five minutes, it changes. Mm -hmm. So we wanna make sure that we lift up the homeless in their situation and uh, pray that they find gainful employment and housing and those kind of things so they can get their lives back on track. Uh, we really hope and pray that that happens in their lives. So uh, let us go to God in prayer today. Lord, we lift all these people up to you and all these prayers up to you for all of the hurt in the world, for all of the healing that needs to take place. Lord, we lift them up to you. We claim them today as victories in your name, Lord Jesus. We lift the people up who, who have come to visit and we, we lift up sicknesses that, that pop up unexpectedly. And we lift those up to you and we claim your victory in your name over those sicknesses today. And for those who have gone through procedures, Lord, and, and who are continuing to heal, we ask that you would bring them through this and, and bring them through better than what they were before. And we claim those as a victory in your name. And we pray for the homeless and the lost in this world that we might be a beacon of hope, that we might be able to shine our light and be your hands and feet to those who need healing, that who need that, that hope in their lives. Let us show them that there is faith to be had in you and that there is more to life than simply existing day to day. Lord, you've got a plan for their lives as well, and we ask that you would help us to show them that they need to live that plan out, having faith and love in your grace, in your mercy, in your salvation. And we pray all these things as victories in Jesus' name today. We claim them in your name. And Lord, you have promised us in the scriptures that what we bring to you by prayer and petition with an earnest heart, Lord, you will answer these prayers. And we say thank you, Lord, for your truth, for your faithfulness, and Lord, that you never change. And your time is endless. We thank you, Lord God, that you do these things for us today. Thank you, Lord God. For those of you online, thank you for joining us for this online portion of our service. Uh, there will be a link in the notes on uh, the worship music for today, all very intentionally picked, and uh, because I'm picking the music today, I snuck an extra one in there. Don't tell my wife, she doesn't know yet. Um, because it just was speaking to me last night as I was finishing some things up. I got home from the movie last night, and it's like, okay, uh, when you go out to the website, up pops the Chronicles of Narnia movie this week. It's like, oh, nope, you got to change that message. And so I got on there, and as I was doing that, I was just listening to music, and this uh, another song came in. And rather than take one out, we kept it. So we invite you to join us by uh, worshiping through the music in that link. <coughs> Pray with me as we close this portion of our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, everything starts with faith. In Hebrews 11, 6, you tell us that we need to have faith in order to be able to please you. We understand that there is a difference between having a true relationship with you and just simply going through a laundry list of tasks without faith. <coughs> We can't earn a relationship.
relationship with you by what we do. The scriptures tell us in, when Jesus meets the rich man and the rich man says, good teacher. And your son says, no one is good but the Father. So that tells me that there is no way, Father, that we can by our own works, by our own anything, can we be made right with you. Only because of our faith in you, you give us your grace, your love, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Make us yes, righteous in your sight. <coughs> Lord, help us to grow spiritually. Help us to imitate those whose faith that we read about in the Bible gives us the example. Let us have the same patience that those patrons had. Whether it's 25 years, whether it's 40 years, give us that patience because we know that you will give us what you have promised us. And Father, it sometimes is hard for us to understand, but sometimes that promise may not come into fruition even in our own lifetimes. But you will make good on your promise. We have faith in that. And finally, Father God, give us the wisdom on how we can communicate the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, to this ever-darkening world. Let us do it with sensitivity and with faithfulness, Father. Give us courage to proclaim your good news throughout the world. In Jesus' precious and holy name. And all God's people said,